This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. This show is brought to you by Pet King Brands, the makers of Zymox and Oratine. It's All Behave with Arden Moore, the show that teaches you how to have harmony in the household with your pets. Join Arden as she travels coast to coast to help millions better understand why cats and dogs do what they do. Get the latest scoop on famous faces. They're perfectly pampered pets in Who's Walking Who in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails. Garner great pet tips and have a doggone fur-flying fun time. So get ready for the pause and applause as we unleash your all-behave host, America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Welcome to the All Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. Hey guys, you're in for a special treat. This is a very, very, very special episode because it's actually being posted on not one, but two shows on the Pet Life Radio Network. I was interviewed by the amazing Tim Link. He is the host of the show Animal Rights. Because guess what, guys? I just wrote two new books. One is called A Kid's Guide to Dogs, starring my dog Kona. And the other is A Kid's Guide to Cats, starring my orange tabby Casey. And I was very blessed that uh, Tim interviewed me for his show. So this is kind of like two shows in one. We're going to find out more after we take this commercial break. So sit and stay. We'll be right back. Time for a pause. Four furry ones, actually. Sit and stay. All Behave will be right back. Hey, pet pals, Arden Moore here. Is your dog or cat prone to ear infections? Does your pet resist having his ears clean when they're inflamed or irritated? Are you also concerned about the overuse of antibiotics? Help is here. Zymox ear care products offer soothing relief, and you'll love this part. They don't require the ear to be cleaned before you apply the drops. It's just as easy as fill, rub, and done. That means less touching of those sensitive ears to help create a soothing, fear-free experience. And you only apply once a day. Here's another perk. Zmox at Z-Y-M-O-X gets its effectiveness from enzymes, not antibiotics. You'll find these veterinary recommended products through your veterinarian, most pet specialty retailers, and online. To learn more, go to Zymox.com. That's Z-Y-M-O-X. Pause up. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. All Behave is back with more tail-wagging ways to achieve harmony in the household with your pets. Now back to your fetching host, America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Joining me now is uh, my good friend and a fantastic writer. It's uh, Arden Moore. Arden, welcome to the show. Hey, big pause up, Tim. I haven't talked to you in a long time. Nice to it's, hear your voice. Yeah, nice to hear your voice, too. It's been a while. Uh, I should have said welcome back to the show because, obviously, you have your own show on Pet Life Radio, and you've been on this show uh, uh, several times in the past. And now we have two, not one, but two new books to talk about. The first one's A Kid's Guide to Dogs, and the second is A Kid's Guide to Cats. So I want to tell uh, tell our audience a little bit about about the books, what should, they should expect, and uh, you know how the whole concept came about. Well, I'm I'm so excited, Tim, because there's a kid in every one of us. But as a, a pet behaviorist and someone who does a lot of presenting all over the country with my dog Kona and my cat Casey, a lot of times there's kids in the audience, or we'll go to a kid camp at an SPCA or an animal shelter. And all of this was what was the the motivation, if you will, to do this pair of books that are aimed at kids, primarily age eight and up. And I got to tell you, I've written a lot of books. I've ghostwritten books. I've been a reporter. I was a reporter for 20 years. I love these books. I got to tell you, these are my, I got to humbly say, I've had more fun doing these books than anything I've ever done on the planet. Wow. Well, and it's important too. Two questions come right to mind is you said the the audience for the books is sort of eight and up. Why do we start at eight years old and how important is it to get our our kids involved as early as possible, but yet when they're old enough to be able to, uh, to handle a cat or a dog? 
you kind of hit it on the head. It, it, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I don't play one on TV or radio, but usually about age eight and up, and, you know, kids really understand empathy for others, including the four leggers in their lives. And so we felt like that was a good launching pad. They're about, you know, first, second grade or whatever. And I got to tell you, I've had kids take my pet first aid classes and some of them have been as young as nine or 10 and they nail it. They nail every demo. They know what they're doing. So we wanted to get to the age where they, they read, they know that that dog and cat has feelings and that they want to do what they can to be a big brother or a big sister to that dog or cat in their family. Yeah. And I, and I think it's an important thing to do. Uh, you know, I, I have young nieces just throw that out there right now. And they, uh, a couple of years ago, got their first dog. And it was great. You know, they're exciting. They still play with the dog and still love the dog, but they had no clue. And their parents hadn't had a new a new dog for a long time. Uh, this was a puppy when they got the dog. So, you know, puppy's a whole different thing than having a mature dog. That's true. <laughs> so trying to get them to understand the not only the joys and the fun and the relationship and uh, really, like you said, having a, a little furry brother or sister in the family now, but also the responsibilities behind it. Right. And, and one of the elements that is in both of these books is we have a little fun with the kids and we have like a little chore list what they can do. And we give them some fun uh, tricks that they can do and some do it yourself things they can make. Like you can actually make a dog bed out of an old suitcase and we give the kids step by step on how to do that. And, uh, you know, it's kind of neat. One of my favorite topics is I teach the kids how to be poopologist. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, kids like to talk about poop and pee mm -hmm. and puke, the three P's, but we're helping them be pet detectives so they can tell their mom and dad, hey, you know, Kona's poop was kind of runny today or, you know, woohoo, there was a big puddle in the litter box from Casey. And so we're teaching kids, the next generation of pet advocates, things to look for that they can catch that might be able to help a pet that's not feeling well. But the kids love it. They love when I go and tell them I'm going to make them a poopologist, their attention is right there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fantastic. In the what you've done in the books, you know, like you said, it, it makes it interesting, fun, little uh, chores, little activities, little things. Because face it, uh, typically you, when you're young, you, you're getting that you want a puppy or a kitty and you want to play with them. But, you know, all of a sudden you've got to go take them out for walks, you know, if it's a dog. You've got to change the litter pans, these type of things. Not fun. You've come up with some great ideas to make it fun and interesting and uh, turn poop into something that's, a, that's fun and exciting. Yeah, we tell kids that you want to impress your parents. Just say your, your cat hacked up a tribazor, which is the scientific word for hairball. And, you know, it just I think we all at any age learn best when we feel like we're being supported and we feel like it's fun. And so that's the whole kind of the running theme in this book is I want these kids to have fun learning and learning how to be responsible. I mean, Tim, can you tell me the name of one of your first pets? Absolutely. I know all of them by name. <laughs> Bandit was my first dog. Yeah, there Bandit was go. my first dog. Absolutely. And I know uh, the complete history of Bandit, and I took care of him when I was young. I didn't have books to read or become a poopologist, but uh, <laughs> it was basically but, but think about that. Yeah, think about that, because... My first dog was an overweight beagle named Crackers, and my first cat was a Siamese cat named Corky, who would swim in our backyard lake with Crackers. And I mean, I think the magic is that first pet we get, and that's what I'm hoping with the kid's guide to the dogs and the kid's guide to cats, is I want to give the kids a good, successful starting point so that when they get that bandit or Crackers or Corky, they're going to have good information and be able to have a great relationship. We don't forget our first pet. It's really a special moment in life. Yeah, it is. And I think that even throughout life, when you're young, as well as when you start to you know, become an adult, you know, animals, as you know, you've worked with animals for years and written about them for years. They are the, a great common denominator and a great bonding uh, way you know everyone loves an animal everybody's had an animal or had multiples whether they had haven't had one for years or, or have had them throughout their whole life it is a great way to bond and i think for kids in particular wouldn't you think that it would be a great opportunity for them to learn about their own pets but also bond and learn and help share that with their friends as well 
I totally uh, agree with you, Tim. And one thing that I think separates this pair of books that I wrote, it's with uh, story books, which is part of Workman, is that it isn't me just talking to the kids about what they can do to be better pet caretakers. Throughout the pages of the book are my dog, Kona, who's a terrier mix, and my orange tabby, Casey. And they talk to the kids because we go all over the country. They've actually now traveled to 13 states giving talks and behavior and first aid. And there's a lot of kids that love Casey and Kona. So I love the fact that on the pages, we have pull out sidebars where Kona's talking to them or Casey's talking to the kids. Like, you know, because Casey's an orange tabby and he thinks all orange tabbies are cool, smart, and hot looking. And Kona's telling about how to, you know, sneak a treat, you know, and things like that. So I think the element of having a real dog and a real cat in the pages of the book adds to the fun and hopefully the learning. Absolutely. So they can form that relationship and that, that friendship with your own pets that have been through it as well. Now, reflecting back at earlier, you were saying that when you have the kids take your classes, your first aid classes, and when you're speaking, you said they were spot on. Do you think that is mostly dealing with the fact that kids are open to everything and they have that empathy, they have that connection with animals already, or is it just their pure ability to be a sponge to, to want to learn <laughs> something that's fun? It may be a little combo of both because I do know, you know, parents come when I'm teaching first aid. So this is a, a family outing, if you will, because the kids will come with a, a mom, dad, or a guardian, or a big sister or brother. And the other thing is, maybe they are like sponges. They don't have their, their head isn't so full of stuff like our heads are, that they're more open to learning. And, you know, there's just something, there's just pure love that a kid can give a dog or a cat. And it's always evident when I see them in my classes or my talks. Absolutely. So you mentioned one of the fun little activities you've got in there, how to take a suitcase and make it a, a doggy bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What are some of the other unique things in there? Because I have to admit, you got me on that one. I've seen a lot of, of really cool things and I've done a lot of crazy cool things that worked out real well. I've never turned my old suitcase into a doggy bed. That's for sure. So you got me there. What other cool oh. things can we expect from the books? The you know, I'm also trying to uh, recycle. So we have a DIY on how to take a tire, an old tire, a little bit of non-toxic paint, get a blanket or a pillow. And we show you step-by-step -step how to make a doggy bed out of a big tire because dogs like to do that little curl when they sleep a lot of times. And so that's a good one. And then for the cats, because uh, we don't want to under forget about the kitties. I like it because we've come up with things like how to make a treat container just using your empty paper towel roll and how to cut some holes in it and pinch the ends and boom, you got a little treat puzzle for your kitty, which they really like. We also show you how you can take a cardboard box and an old t-shirt for the kids and make a cat condo because kitties like to hide in places. So it's kind of cool. So you got an old t-shirt and a cardboard box and kaboom, you got a cat condo. So you teach them how to recycle, how to put, have some arts and crafts so the family can yeah. join in with the kids. And uh, you're not spending an arm and a leg because as you know, as well as I do, uh, <laughs> yeah. half the paycheck goes to the animals. <laughs> oh, I know. It's really scary when your veterinarian knows you when you walk in the vet clinic or the big box store, you know, like Petco or Petco. They, Hi, Arden. Nice to see you. The famous word again. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but absolutely. Just, so the other thing that was kind of fun in the book, and I, I've got to give a pause up. There's a number of great veterinarians who helped me through the years. So what I did in writing these two books, I asked kids all over the country questions. What's a burning question you have? And then I would send that question to one of my favorite veterinarians. So throughout the pages of the book, there's a running section called Ask the Vet. And, you know, so one kid asked if, can a dog still have a good time with only three legs? Or why is a dog so playful? And, you know, these veterinarians gave a chance to be able to, to answer that question. And as far as for the cats, I'm just trying to find one of the questions because they're throughout everywhere. It's not in a, it's just thrown at us. Yeah, that's okay. the one thing, as you point out, never want to leave out the cats. They'll never let you forget it. If you, if you don't. Yeah, <laughs> little eight-year-old Reagan from Seattle, Washington asked, how can cats jump so high 
when they're so small? I thought that was a brilliant question from an eight-year-old. And the answer was dished up by Dr. Marty Becker, America's family veterinarian. So sure. I thought that was kind of cool. So, you know, I love the fact that I could include kids in these books. And from the veterinarian standpoint, I'm sure they loved it as well, because how often do they get asked those type of questions? It's always the serious questions or, you know, what is this medication? Do I need this surgery? You know, really uh, things that you know, can wear on a veterinarian. Now they're getting kids involved asking interesting, fun, and uh, compelling questions. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, you know, and we have some trivia. I'm going to test your trivia. Okay. Do cats only purr when they're content? True or false? I'm going to ask you, Tim. I would say false. That's right. They purr when they're scared, too. And they do it yeah. to self calm. Woohoo! Power Woo. to them. <laughs> so we, we have some fun. Like, how many muscles in an ear of a dog? Now, my dog, Kona, has very expressive ears, but would it be 8, 10, 12, or 14? What do you think of average dog, the number of muscles in an ear? Oh, man. Now, you know, you know thinking <laughs> that just off the top of my head, you don't think of an ear as even a muscle, but we know they are because they move and they can flip them and flop them and turn them. I'm going with 14. Ooh, Ooh. close. 12. Oh. That's okay. Yeah. That new car that was going to come your way, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always know a four-part question. You always choose C, right? That yeah, I should have with that. That's <laughs> but it's, it's fun because you know we're we're asking kids stuff, and then they can tell kids, and all of a sudden learning becomes fun. And so I've worked with this publisher at Story Books for other books in the past. I've worked with four different publishing houses, and they saw my post on Facebook and other social media venues that were having me in the classes with Kona and Casey because we dressed them up and uh, Kona wears a red bandana, the dog, and Casey, the orange tabby, of course, comes in in a pet stroller wearing a cowboy hat. And we play a game with the kids called Canine Feline Fact or Fiction with your game show host, Kona and Casey. And so the kids get groups and we give them a multiple choice answer and they have to, in their groups, kind of figure out what the answer might be. And then they come up and they get to count the whiskers on Casey and they get to watch the ears. We do a little stereo, you know, call one side, one the other, and people watch Kona's ears. And so we show them why the answer is what it is. And so I think that's what caught the attention of my publisher. And I do want to give a shout out to Lisa Hiley, she is my editor and she's damn good at it. And she also loves dogs and cats. So it was nice to be paired up with an editor that also loves pets and knows pets. So so she kept seeing it. And the next thing I know, I got a two book deal. Yeah, got to love it. Got to love it. All right. Well, we're going to take a uh, quick commercial break. We're going to come back with uh, Arden Moore, talk to her a little bit more about the, the books and, and what she hopes to uh, accomplish with the books. But that's a perfect segue into writing because I want to pick the uh, master's brain on, uh, on writing and publishing as well. So sit and stay. We'll be right back. Time for a walk on the red carpet, of course. All Behave will be back in a flash right after these messages. Pause up, everybody. It's Arden here. I've got a cat confession about my feline foodie, Casey, the orange tabby. Love the guy. But we now have to put all the food we've prepared for dinner into the microwave if we want to enjoy a civil meal in the living room without him stalking the kitchen and helping himself. You know, that's some stuff I can live with. What I can't deal with is a smelly litter box. So I use Arm & Hammer Clump and Seal. It clumps tight around odor and destroys it for a seven-day odor-free home, guaranteed. Because an odor-free home is a happy home. Arm & Hammer, more power to you. Hey, pet pals, Arden Moore here to unleash some great health advice. It's time to be down in the mouth for the benefit of your dog and cat. Unleashing good oral care is one of the best ways to show love for your pet. Do you find brushing your pet's teeth challenging? Here is a terrific solution. Treat your dog to Oratine Brushless Oral Care. Oratine makes caring for your pet's oral health super easy. The difference is the enzymes. The advanced enzyme technology in Oratine works to freshen the breath. It eliminates bacteria, fungus, and yeast. Yuck. 
They also reduce plaque biofilm from accumulating on the teeth. And guess what? None of these products require actual brushing. Woohoo! You can choose from these three products. One, a water additive that gives your pet the benefits of oral care with every lap of water. Two, a breath freshening spray with a gentle mister. Or three, a brushless toothpaste gel you can apply with your finger. If your pet tolerates brushing, hey, you can always brush too. To learn more, visit Zymox.com, Z-Y-M-O-X.com, and look under the oral care product line. Do it today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Pet Hi there, I'm Kate Walton. I hope you're going to tune in and listen to OB Hayes on Pet Life Radio with Arden Moore because she's a delight. We're back from the lot. Just checked the paper and we had a record showing at the box. The letterbox, that is. Now back to OB Hayes. Here's Arden. Welcome back to the Old Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. It's kind of a weird position for me, guys, because I'm the host, but I'm the guest on Tim Link's Animal Rights Show that you're listening to here today. So because of the two books I wrote, The Kid's Guide to Dogs and A Kid's Guide to Cats, they just came out. Now, Arden, we talked about all the, the great things that are in these books, uh, A Kid's Guide to Dogs and A Kid's Guide to Cats. Fun things, unique things, uh, interesting play trivia. Uh, I was 50-50 on the, on the questioning, so okay. But when the kids and, and their parents purchase the books and they read through them and they have fun with all the activities and everything, is there a, a, something you're really wanting them to walk away with? Is there a message you're wanting? Is there something you're hoping that by the time they're all said and done, uh, they feel or get from the books? I think my wish is that the family is defined to include that four-legger or three-legger in your life. And I think that they're going to see the value of that dog or that cat as a, a bona fide member of the family and how much they can help and bring out the best in the pet and how much that pet can bring out the best in them. Because sometimes you've got to have a confidant. And you know what? Dogs and cats dab. And so sometimes when you're not feeling, you're feeling a little blue or you're a little nervous or something, you have a confidant that purrs or or has a nice tail wag that you can talk to. So my wish is that people realize the power of the paw. Absolutely. I think that's a great message. And it definitely comes through at the books. And, you know, you always make things fun and exciting. You have a new twist, uh, you know, whether we're talking about your, your radio shows or your, your first aid classes or your speeches, everything you're doing is always so much fun and fun to be around and, and to talk to you, Arden. And, but I love the underlying message. I, you know, it, as you mentioned, I think earlier, it's it, a lot of people can produce a book and sort of give you the facts, which right. you know, is great, great reference material. But you give them the facts without beating them over the head and you make it fun. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't want to get beat over the head. You know, I, I've, I've been blessed through my years to have really good mentors as uh, editors. And the main message is, is you want to be able to have the person feel like they're safe and able to learn and to be able to share stories that make a difference. I mean, my whole message in whatever I do is I want to bring out the best in pets and their people. And I purposely phrase it that way because it's a win-win for everybody. And uh, so, yeah, I, I'm a punter. I do have bad puns, you know, but I got to be true to my writing voice. If I'm writing a book to kids and I want it to be fun, they're going to be groaning or laughing at some of my bad jokes, but it's okay. It's worth the risk because you're reaching this amazing young audience. Absolutely. And you do a great job at it for sure. Well, let's pick your brain as a writer then. I, I've lost count. I know it's, I'm probably underestimating, but I know you've had to produce at least 30 books. You know, that's I don't know how many because and I'm not trying to be weird. I'm not Stephen King or Dean Koontz here, but I've done at least 27 dog and cat books. But I worked at Rodale Press, which is where Prevention Magazine and Men's Health is for a number of years. And I either wrote books, co-authored books, ghost wrote books. And then I also teamed up with a medical doctor from Minnesota and wrote a few books. I actually ghost wrote 
some books with Jerry Baker, America's Master Gardener, and I came up with corny phrases like, aloe can be your palo, and go <laughs> with the mo. But then I went and, and wrote a book with a naturopathic physician called Nature's Virus Killers, and I'm talking about T cells and lymphocytes, and oh my gosh, my brain hurts. So I don't really know because I've written books, I've co-authored, I've ghostwritten. You understand as a writer, Absolutely. Well, and that's the fascinating thing. I, you know, when I look at your, your uh, portfolio, your bio, uh, and when we're just talking specifically about writing, because all the other wonderful stuff you do uh, for animals and with animals, uh, there's a huge list. But the writing, I mean, how is, do you as a writer, whether you're doing a ghost writing, whether it's a, a topic, whether you're you know, a reporter or you're writing for a magazine on health or natural health, whatever it may be, and then all the wonderful stuff you do for animals, and those books are so diverse. How do you get your mindset on a topic you want to tackle or if someone approaches you like your publishing house saying, hey, we, we love these ideas. Can you put together a, a book for us? You know, it's not that easy. No, but it is important to always keep in mind who is your audience because it can change. I write regularly for Dogster and Catster magazine. Those are the number one pet magazine publications now. And I know the style. The style is conversational empowering and they need to have a story that relates to them that's one kind of tip when i'm sometimes figuring it out i take my dog on a walk and it's like my cup of coffee i have a clear head i'm not staring at a computer screen i gotta dodge the doggy landmines you know and other things so sometimes i get my best ability to figure out how i'm gonna write it by clearing my head and doing something like a wonderful thing like walking with Kona and Bujo on a walk around White Rock Lake because there's nothing to distract me, to tug at me, except two wonderful dogs on, on leads. And so maybe that might help others too is step away from the keyboard, step away from the monitor, get away from your phone and talk out loud or just think, if I was going to read about this, what do I really want to know? And the, th the other element is, don't get locked into the same old, same old. What they do now in veterinary medicine or health and what I did 20 years ago covering it is have evolved. So I think a key to a good writer is the willingness to always learn new and to always be able to, to not get in a rut. Don't be lazy. Don't think, well, I wrote it that way before. I'm going to write it again. Treat yourself to a new turn of the phrase or a new tip that you can share with, with your readers. Excellent. I think it's great advice. You know, that's one of the things, you know, I, I've been doing this show for quite a while now. And, and so I always love to pick the brains of, you know, writers and authors and bloggers and people that are putting the, their message out there in whatever form it is. And each person is different, how they handle it. And, and as you uh, perfectly stated it, how you did it, how you did it 20 years ago when you were a teenager, Arden. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it so much. <laughs> There you go. But, you know, that's different. You know, how we approach it uh, years ago and how we approach it now, the audience changes. Even if you're writing for the same publication or you're writing for a similar publication, how you attract people and how you get their attention and, and keep them wanting to read what you're writing is a challenge. And you have to come up with some ways to, uh, to get their attention. It's a good challenge. And it's a challenge that keeps you young, that keeps you going, because I don't want to interview the same experts all the time. I find experts at the grocery store or when I'm on a vacation, you never know where that person's going to be. So you file that away. And so the readers get fresh insights and things like that. And also, if you're doing any kind of topic that's of any kind of controversy, I always say that your role as the writer is to be the referee in the boxing match. You're supposed to give each one a chance to have a blow at each other and let the reader decide. And so, you know, when I talk about nutrition, I know that's like trying to talk about religion and politics in the same breath. Me, wow, you're going to have a food fight. But if you give good sources from both sides of the issue, and let the person decide, then you're not telling them what to do. And that's a big key, too, in writing. You're kind of a guide, you know. You're not a teller, you must do this. You're guiding people to make, hopefully, good, safe, correct decisions. 
Excellent. I think that's great advice. And for those that are looking to publish, maybe publish their, their first book, get their first book out there, what would your, be your sage advice uh, <laughs> in, in that? You know, Because like you said, it's fascinating. I always talk to wonderful authors and writers like yourself that have been doing it for, for quite some time as well as newcomers on the scene and how they get their first break or how they get that next new thing. It changes, even for the most seasoned writer, uh, like you had mentioned. I don't know if you even expected that your publishing house would be looking at what you're doing on Facebook and come up with an idea and say, hey, we want Arden to write this book. Right, and there's more and more people looking at what they call social influencers. So, yes, books are still here. They're just in different formats. And so if you're starting off, just don't be dismayed if a big publisher doesn't grab your first book deal. Fortunately, we live in an age where you can self-publish, where you can do it on a video approach. I mean, we have so many different medias now that the person who wants to be able to communicate a story or a message, there's so many different outlets. And don't try to eat the whole cake on the first plate, you know. You might just get a little sliver, but you'll build on that. And so I want people to know, just keep evolving and life hits us good and bad. And all of those lessons make us, I think, a better writer. Because if I lived this perfect life where I never got a flat tire, or, you know, I never had a big vet bill or I never had a pimple or whatever, I don't think that would make me as good of a compassionate person to, to write. You know, life's oopsies actually sometimes can make you a better writer. There you go. I think you're right. I think you're right. And we know that just like me, we've had our share of vet bills, so we're okay. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's really scary when your your pet bill outdoes your grocery bill and other things. You know, you know what? I think I'm doing it the right way. I, I do want <laughs> a shout out. I have a furry Brady Bunch. We have the two dogs, Bujo and Kona, and we have four cats. Um, we have Casey, the orange tabby, the star of the book. But we also have little old senior Mikey and one-eyed Mort. And I just adopted this amazing kitten named Rusty, who's been trained by the amazing Acrocats in Georgia by Samantha Martin. And this is a seven-month-old kitten. I can blow a whistle. He will come running and sit in front of me and sit up on cue. He jumps through hoops. He is amazing. So he's going to be trained to help us with these kid books and go to our therapy pet visits. So you never know what magic a dog or a cat might have. And and I'm hoping with these two books that kids are going to find out. I mean, years ago, I had an 11-pound dog, Tim, who loved to surf. And she surfed a heck of a lot better than I did. And I gave her that chance. She wanted to do it. So, you you know, I'm hoping these books will also show to people there's these hidden talents in your kids and yourself and your dogs and your cats and finding it and tapping into it. Wow, that's that's magic. Yeah, absolutely. A good, good message. I appreciate it. Well, where can people pick up a copy of both the books, A Kid's Guide to Dogs and A Kid's Guide to Cats? And where can they follow uh, what's going on in your wonderful world? Well, the good news is it's on Amazon and it's going to be in a lot of independent bookstores. There's a hardcover, softcover, and the e-reader Kindles that are out there now. If they go to Amazon, they'll get a little bit about the bios. They just came out, so they're hot off the press. I hope people can follow me on Facebook. It's Arden Moore, very easy. And my website, let's keep it easy, ArdenMoore.com. And of course, I hope they tune in to your show as well as mine on Pet Life Radio, which is my show is called Oh Behave. <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely tune into Arden's show. It's, uh, she's interviewed uh, anybody and everybody that's ever loved a furry fin feathered or uh, scaled animal. So uh, definitely a great show to listen to. And everybody pick up a copy of both the books. You're going to need them, whether you have kids or not, whether you have dogs and cats or both or not, doesn't matter. Great books, a lot of fun, a lot of lessons that you can enjoy with uh, with kids and your nieces and nephews and your grandkids and just have fun with them and learn a lot along the way as well. So uh, everybody pick up a copy that's a kid's guide to dogs and a kid's guide to cats by the wonderful Arden Moore. Arden, it's so fantastic to talk to you again. Congratulations on the, uh, the two books and we'll look forward to continuing following all your wonderful escapades. I really appreciate being back on your show, Tim, and I hope if I'm in your neck of the woods, I can come by and uh, hand deliver these books to you. Absolutely. Doors always open, my friend. Well, we did it, guys. 
This is a two-in-one show with my friend and colleague, Tim Link, who hosts Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. As you can hear, he's interviewed me about my books and about writing. And this is also being posted on my show, The O Behave Show. So at this time, I want to say thank you again, Tim, for letting me be a, a guest on your show. I want to do a shout out to my producer, Mark Winter, because while this show was being recorded, he became a grandfather. He prefers to be called G-Pop to a wonderful baby named Jacob. So we give a big shout out to Mark Winter. And until next time, everybody, this is your flea free host, Arden Moore, delivering just two words to all you two three, and four-leggers out there. Oh, behave. Coast to coast and around the world, it's Oh, Behave with Arden Moore. Find out why cats and dogs do the things they do and get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get great tail-wagging pet tips and have a fur-flying fun time. Oh, Behave with America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.